Today on Fight to Win, I am finishing up on practically step-by-step -step how to walk by faith. You're not gonna wanna miss this powerful things. Not only that, I wanna talk to you about a self-defense tool and a practical tool that every person should carry. To succeed in life, we have to fight. That's why winners train spirit, soul, and body. We have to be ready. Not your typical minister, Kurt Owen left a successful career in private investigation and executive protection for the ministry over 20 years ago. His simple, practical application of God's word will reveal how much Jesus loves you and give you the ability to fight to win. Now, get ready for a tactical tip from Pastor Kurt. You know, a lot of times people ask me if I was only gonna carry one tool what tool would I carry for self-defense and a lot of things? To be honest, the one tool I would carry would be a knife, okay? It doesn't matter whether it's, uh, I'm a female, well, I'm not a female, and I don't identify as a female either. No, I'm a male. Uh, and But whether you're a female or a male, a knife is an excellent thing to always have. Now, I, though I do carry karambits and I am trained with karambits, I do encourage you to get a straight blade because it just has more uses. Uh, it can cut normal things, but then it can also cut your steak. Uh, I've tried to cut a steak before with a karambit while it was on my plate. It didn't work very well. Now, normally I actually carry two different knives. This one would be more a self-defense. Um, James Olson from the Olson Combat System gave this to me. It is a Spyderco Delica. It's a very light knife, but it's got an aftermarket ring that I really kind of like. Um, it actually, it hooks on my pocket. It's not an automatic knife, but I can utilize it um, that it'll actually deploy the minute I, I draw it from out of my pocket. But I, another knife that I carry, this is a Boker Automat Kalishnikov. I use this to cut tape and stuff like that. I never use this knife to cut tape. This is only for self-defense. And so uh, this knife uh, is my kind of knock around knife. The reason I pick knives for every day is because it has self-defense uses and everyday practical uses. Hello, I'm Kurt Owen. Welcome back to Fight to Win. We are finally at the last day of how to walk by faith, and I have a lot to say. Uh, this is my fourth week teaching on the subject, much to my producer's chagrin. And so, um, you know, I think I told you they only wanted me to go like 10 at a time and, you know, it just, you can't do that when you're talking about faith. There's just too, and, and quite frankly, I, I've covered, there's so much more I haven't covered. That's the reason that this series is 19 hours. And that's the reason my partners and I want to get this to you absolutely free. You go to KurtOwen.com and you can re request it right there. And we'll be glad to give it to you or call the number at the bottom of your screen. Now, kind of like I said yesterday, um, I have so much to say today, I'm not going to be able to really truly review. So let me just kind of catch you up, okay? For the last three weeks um, and four days, right, we've been talking about how to walk by faith. And what we've done is, is through Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, where it says, imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. What we've done is we found out our father of our faith, what he did to walk by faith. And now we're going to imitate him and we're going to receive the same way he received. Okay. And that's what we're going for. And today I've got something that is extremely important because there's going to be a point at which you start believing God and there's going to be a period of time elapse and you are going to have a, a tendency to want to back off or or become weak in faith? And how do you handle that? What do you do while you're waiting for what you believed you received to show up in the here and now? What do you do? I'm going to answer that today. Now, again, um, let, let me show this to you right quick, uh, just for the sake of time. Go with me to, uh, where would, did we end up in yesterday? Genesis chapter 15. And I just want to go through this because I was kind of buzzing through it. Basically, God and Abraham have a conversation or Abram have a conversation in the first part of the chapter. And um, God tells him, do not be afraid. I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward, literally meaning uh, rapidly increasing financial supply. And 
Abram says, that's great, Lord, but I, what I really want is a kid. That's verse 2. Then he takes him outside, and this is important that you actually see it. Verse 5, then he brought him outside, look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. He said to them, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, right? And he says, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. Now, in response, Abram, because he really doesn't, I mean, they're just, they're really just developing their relationship. He says to the Lord, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a, he- a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old tur- ram, a turtle dove, a young pigeon. Then he brought these, all of these to him and he cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness also fell upon him. Now, I, need to, I want you to see a timeline, and I want you to see something here, okay? God's talking to him, and it's nighttime, right? And he tells him what to do. He tells him to uh, cut these animals in two. So really what he's doing is he's, cut, he's making a blood covenant with him. So what the, God, he's going to do is he's going to cut the animal. Maybe someday I'll teach on blood covenant. But he's going to cut the animals down the middle, Okay, and there's going to be this pool, this trail of blood in between the two. Now, in a normal blood covenant ceremony, the two covenant partners would actually walk in that blood. They would feel it on their feet and then they would make their promises and they would make circles in that blood talking to each other. And they would pronounce the blessings and the curses of the covenant. Okay, is what would happen. And when somebody cut that covenant, you knew that they will not break this covenant. Okay, it is a blood covenant. But I want you to see something here. It's nighttime God gives him in some instruction. He shows him a picture and then gives him some instruction. Now, Abram was known to get up early and do things. He, was, uh, he, he would do that. Because remember what happened when uh, he was told to sacrifice Isaac, right? It says that he got up early in the morning to head out. So, um, and that was to sacrifice his son much less these animals. So let's say that he got up first thing in the morning and cut these animals in two. Now God has told him, this is what I want you to do. I want you to cut all these animals in two. Well, Abraham does it. Abram does it, excuse me. His name hasn't been changed yet. And guess what? Nothing happens. (laughs) He cuts these animals in two. He has just spent money because that's money laying there because he sells livestock. He's, He's just spent money and he's been completely obedient. And now the money's been spent. He's gone to all this trouble, all this energy to do this. And guess what? Nothing happens. Not a thing. Not, not any music from heaven. Nothing. This is, we're going to have days like this in our walk of faith where we're going to do absolutely everything God told us to do. And it's going to look like nothing's happening. Let me hold your place there. But I want you to see this over in Ephesians. I really kind of wish I had another week. Ephesians, this says this. It says, um, um, let's see, uh, did not whistle, therefore take up. Um, this, in verse 13, it says, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Having done all to stand. What does that mean? It means you just did everything you knew to do and it doesn't look like anything's changed and you're going to have to stand. There are going to be days like this. And to put it in relation to Genesis 15, there are going to be days you're going to do everything you've known to do. You've been perfectly obedient and it looks like nothing is happening. And you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to fight the buzzards off of your obedience is what you're going to have to do. Because there's going to be plenty of opportunity during that day to say, listen, I can't believe I spent all this money. I must have missed God. It must not have been God. And I'm just quitting. I, I, this is what I'm, I'm not doing this. I thought it was God. Evidently it wasn't. If it was God, he would have shown up by now. You ever had that thought? If it was God, he would have shown up by now. You've got to fight the buzzards off your obedience. It would have been easier for him just to say, you know what? I've been out here nearly all day. I'm going to go get me a glass of lemonade and just sit down. 
If it was, let the buzzards have those things, because after all, after all, um, if it was God, wouldn't something have happened by now? I, I thought I did everything he told me to do. See, guys, it is not like watching a Hallmark movie where you do everything right and then wham, there it is. Everything works out. Sometimes you're going to have done all and then you're going to have to stand. You're going to have to fight the buzzards off of your obedience. You're going to have to make up your mind that I don't care how long it takes, I'm going to remain in obedience to God. I refuse to allow the buzzards. I'm not departing. I'm going to remain consistent. Remember where it says over there in uh, Hebrews 6, 12, where it says um, that through faith and patience, your patience to be consistently constant, you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to be completely obedient to God. And then there's going to be a period of time sometimes where you're going to have to, you've done everything you know to do. You don't know anything else that you're supposed to do, and you're going to have to stand. And, and it's time to quit being a crybaby and suck it up, buttercup, and stand. Start fighting the buzzards. That's what you need to do. It's not going to act, it's not a presto magic button with God. There's going to be times you're going to have to stand. Well, why is that? I have no idea. I would like for him to show up the minute I cut the animals in half. I'd love for that to happen. But it doesn't always work that way. But God, is, he's going to do what he said he was going to do. He's going to do it because he cannot lie. Now, but here's the problem. How do you remain strong enough to no matter how tired you are, you keep smacking buzzards? How can you, once you've done all, how can I continue to stand? Well, let's look at what Romans chapter 8 says. And again, I said a lot about walking with God and a lot of other, the other parts of it. I can't cover it right now. Please go to curdowen.com and listen to the other services. But I want to get down to this part, okay? And normally I'd review the whole thing, but I, I, don't, I really truly don't have time. It says, as not being weak, oh, no, excuse me, verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. We covered that yesterday. You're going to have to make a choice to believe. But was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. The way you remain strong in faith and empower you to keep fighting the buzzards, and in the New Testament, the way to keep fighting the buzzards off of your obedience is by by thanksgiving and worship and giving glory to God in line with the promise. You need to begin instead of saying, we've been talking about believing God for a pair of socks. When the thought comes, listen, you're not getting your pair of socks. You might as well just give up on this. Maybe, maybe next time. The devil's really big on maybe next time. Just go ahead and quit this time. Maybe next time. You'll get them next time. No, I'm going to get them right now. I'm going to win right now. I'm not giving up. I'm going to win right now. Devil, you've got to quit. I don't have to quit. I don't have to quit. You eventually have to give in to me. I never have to give in to you. My backing's bigger than your backing. You've got no backing. And I've got the God of all creation on my side. But what do you do? Begin to give glory to God. You're not going to get your socks. Lord, I just want to thank you. I just want to praise you and honor you, Lord, that your word is true. Lord, I thank you that whatsoever I ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, you give me. I asked you in the name of Jesus for a pair of socks. Lord, therefore, you've given me a pair of socks. Lord, you said in your word that whatsoever I ask you, Father, or you said that whatsoever things I desire when I pray, I believe that I receive them and I'll have them. Lord, I desired a pair of socks. I asked you for a pair of socks. And Lord, therefore, I must have received a pair of socks. And so they're coming to my way right now. Lord, I thank you that I abide in you and you abide in me. I can ask you whatever I desire and it'll be done for me and by this you will be glorified uh, um, because I'm going to bear much prayer fruit. And Lord, I just thank you that I've got my socks. Lord, I thank you that you love me far more than a pair of socks. Lord, you would never withhold socks from me. Lord, you have given me all things that pertain to life and godliness and that includes a pair of socks. Lord, I remember when I didn't even have 
I, I didn't have a single pair of socks and I've got plenty of pair of socks and now I got a new pair of socks coming on the way. Lord, I remember when I was hopeless and helpless. Lord, I remember when I was sick and dying. Lord, I honor you. I remember what you've done in my life. Lord, I thank you how you preserved me and protected me. Lord, I thank you for being the God of my salvation. I thank you, Lord, that when I was not looking for you, you came looking for me that you wanted me and you loved me, that you are for me. Lord, I thank you that you have called me your own. I thank you that you've called yourself my shepherd. And Lord, you are a good shepherd. That means you're going to make sure that I'm taken care of. You've called yourself my father and me being your child, you will preserve and protect me. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you, Father. I honor you that you are so much bigger than a pair of socks. Lord, that getting me a pair of socks is nothing to you. Obviously, Lord, the sock. Lord, I just get quiet and I see myself putting these new pair of socks on my feet because, Lord, your word is true. Lord, you are faithful and you are true. And notice how strong you can get doing that. Now, there is another way. I don't have time to get it. I, I mentioned this in a newsletter. Um, remember, I, I wrote nearly 20 months or, uh, of newsletters on how to walk by faith. You can get those by contacting the ministry. Uh, go to KurtOwen.com or shoot us an email, connect at KurtOwen.com and just put in the, the subject line, faith letters, and we'll send them to you absolutely free. And there's a lot of material in there. But y you, need to, you need to stir yourself up in this with thanksgiving. Yeah, oh, excuse me. I, I apologize. Yeah, the Lord just reminded me. I told you that there was another way. There is another way to stir yourself up on faith. And that is by praying in the Spirit. That the Bible says in Jude that, that you build yourselves up on your most holy, on holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, if you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak with other tongues or pray with other tongues, speaking in tongues and praying in tongues are actually two different operations, okay? Um, that's the reason some people get bent out of shape when I pray in the Spirit and they say, well, you can give an interpretation. That's because I wasn't speaking in tongues. I was praying in tongues. And when I pray in tongues, I'm speaking not unto men, but unto God. I'm talking to my Father. When I speak in tongues and I give an utterance in tongues, then it must be interpreted because I, now I'm talking to the men sitting around or, or you watching on television. Vision. There's two different operations there. Okay. But I'm talking about you praying in the spirit that you build yourselves up on your most holy faith, that you're praying when you don't know how to pray for as you ought. Okay. So, and by the way, if you'd like to be uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, I want you to call uh, our number. It's kind of hard to do over email, but um, if you'll call our number or get in one of our meetings, we'll be glad to minister to you so that you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. OK, now, again, listen, I know some of you might be kind of surprised that I'm that I'm speaking tongues because I don't do a whole lot. I don't do a lot of it on the broadcast because um, I, I'm trying. I want you edified. Right. And there's there's a lot that talks about, like, if you speak in English, you, there's more edification. But I do. I pray in tongues a lot. And if that offends you, listen, I, I just want you to stop. And I just want you to think about this. Have you received from the word that I've taught? And have I tried to push you into getting baptized in the Spirit? I have not. What I ask of people where it comes to the baptism of the Holy Ghost is this. If you don't want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to persecute you and demand you have it. You don't have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit to go to heaven. On the other side of it, I don't expect you to persecute me because I believe in it. I'm never going to condemn you because you don't want to, to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why would you condemn me because I have it? OK. And people say, well, I just believe it's of the devil. It's not. I know it because I know God and I know the spirit that I pray in. But there you can build yourself up. But one of the ways, if you don't want to do that, you can, by, by the way, it does say of praying in the spirit that you give thanks. Well, that's part of the operation of praying in the spirit. But we can do that in English, can't we? Lord, I thank you. Now, I'm, I'm going to illustrate healing, okay, because healing is a little bit different, okay, and I'll explain that, why that is, because healing is actually an established fact. I don't have to ask God to heal me or you, because in the mind of God, it's already been established. It's actually unbelief for me to ask God to heal you, because to God, 
He has already healed you. He has paid the price for you to be healed. Okay. So this is the way I handle healing. Okay. We talked about believing for something like socks. What if it's a loved one? Before I get into healing, what if it's a loved one? Lord, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord, that Jeff is saved. I thank you, Lord, that somebody comes across Jeff's path or he receives from these broadcasts to the point he finally, finally, Lord, commits his heart to the Lord. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Jeff's born again. We pray. We spend time praying together and stuff. No, but if I was believing God for Jeff's salvation after I prayed, I'd say, Lord, I just want to thank you that that labor is coming across Jeff's path that will speak the right words. Lord, I see Jeff say, I see him worshiping God with me. Lord, I thank you. I say that Jeff is saved and I thank you for doing that, Lord. And, and, and uh, I, in the name of Jesus, I take authority of everything that would seek to deceive Jeff and keep him from being saved, keep him from hearing the truth of the gospel. Now, I'll just add to that. Don't go around then and start complaining about him. Ah, oh, that Jeff, he's, I mean, he's just so ungodly. He's just so ungodly. No, I'm still, I'm going to, I'm going to, I believe that I received Jeff's salvation and I believe that God's going to do it. By the way, just because you're praying for Jeff doesn't put him in a hammerlock and make him get saved. Because this is what happens to people. And this is one of the reasons they become offended at God. Well, I prayed for Jeff and nothing happened. It could be healing. It can, it can be anything. Anytime it involves somebody else. I prayed for healing for them and they died and they were my mama and I love them. Um, just so you know, if God doesn't make you get saved and doesn't make you get healed, just by you praying, doesn't going to change God's character and make him make somebody else get saved or make somebody else get healed. What it does when you pray for somebody else, it empowers God to continue to operate in and around them to continue to seek to woo them. But God is not going to show up and make them receive healing or make them Uh, get saved just because you prayed. That's the reason the scripture says that when we pray, it makes tremendous power available, dynamic, and it's working. That's the amplified version of James 5, right? Where it says uh, the righteous, the the prayer of a righteous man availeth month. That word there means makes tremendous power available. When we pray for others, it makes power available, but God's not going to make them receive. He didn't make you receive. But let's say it's for me. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for, let's, let's do healing because I, I got to get to healing, right? This is what I would do. Father, I just want to thank you that uh, your word is true and that by the stripes of Jesus, Lord, you have healed me. Lord, I thank you that you yourself took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses. And Lord, I am so grateful that you have done that. I am so grateful and I worship you, Lord. Lord, I thank you that the law, but that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death and whatever your sickness is, is under the law of sin and death. Therefore, I've been made free of that. Thank you, Lord. But then now I've, I've exercised my thanksgiving, but next where healing is concerned, you have to utilize authority. So I've just done, just, just to say, I've just did everything. I just, then I would say, body, you listen to me. I'm talking to you. Jesus paid a price for my healing. I demand right now you be free from cancer. I demand right now in the name of Jesus that you be free from pain and everything that causes it. Jesus himself bore my sicknesses and carried my pains. I refuse to allow pain to continue in you. Pain, I command you to go now in Jesus name because it's already done. It's an already settled fact. Now utilize your authority through the name of Jesus. But every time you prayed for something and it doesn't look like it's going to happen, then you lift your voice and begin to give thanks. Real quick, let's look at this over here in Colossians um, 2, or Colossians 2, or excuse me, Colossians 4 and verse 2, it says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. See, that's what a lot of people miss in their prayer life is they're not vigilant over what they've prayed with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving keeps the switch of faith turned on. It keeps that pressure being applied, not to God, but to the creation and to whatever forces are at operation. Continue in it with thanksgiving and this will strengthen your faith. So every time you start to feel weak and doubt starts to come, begin to worship, praise and give thanks. Now there's one more part to this. 
in today's offering day on the broadcast. So partners, I want you to see what we're doing together. Okay. And it's this last part where it says, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. You have to become fully convinced in the way to do that is to spend much time in the Word of God. And by this broadcast, my partners and I, those that give into this ministry, we are working on a daily basis to convince you of the promises. Now, the way you do it in your own life is the way I've been asking you to do your homework, right? Look at those three scriptures, those nine scriptures, three biggest problems, three scriptures per problem. Keep feeding on those every day and thanking God that they are true to you become, wash your mind with the water of the Word. Now, partners, listen. Um, and those of you who are, uh, are not yet partners, I want to encourage you with something. Here in Philippians, I think I used this last week, but I want to go back at it again this week. This is what it says. It says, now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, When I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again to my necessities. Not that I seek a gift, but I seek fruit that abounds to your account. Now, um, I think it's important here in verse 16, even in Thessalonica, some people are only going to give on the basis of need. And when it says even in Thessalonica, literally what it means is, Uh, Paul was in the most prosperous city of the day. And so it, they could, the Philippians could have had the thought, oh, we don't have to worry about Paul. His every need is supplied. And yet, even when they thought he probably doesn't have a need, they gave anyway because they appreciated his ministry. But something else happened. This verse 19, and my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory was not written to all of the churches. It was not written to everybody in the body of Christ. That is not a blanket promise that applies to every believer. It applies to believers that become partners with ministries. That's who it applies to. Because he didn't write this to everybody. And he's explaining that. He says, now you Philippians know that in in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Notice there, even churches become partners with ministries. We would welcome your church to partner with us. We believe in you. We want to partner with you. But if you would like to live a life where God supplies your every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, it requires you becoming a partner with a ministry. And I would like you to invite you to partner with this ministry. Let's change the world together so that you can have fruit now and when you get to heaven. Let me pray with you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over my partners, both those that have already been partners and those that are becoming partners today. Lord, as they have made the decision to partner with me today, I thank you, Lord, today that their every need is supplied right now, according to Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, I command their needs to be supplied. Devil, you take your hands off their harvest and cause their finance. And Father, I thank you that you will cause their finances to come. Thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Kurt Owen. Thanks for becoming a partner. See you next week. Remember, Jesus is risen. Victory is assured. Catch Pastor Kurt next time on Fight to Win.